Welcome to video number six in Advanced Fluid Mechanics. So in this video, we're gonna be starting section four, which is called laminar flow. So I'm showing here a breakdown of what's gonna be covered in this section. In this video, we're gonna do what's in the white text, and then what's in the gray text we'll cover in the next video. And basically what we're gonna be doing here is looking at laminar flows because laminar flows are simple enough to enable us to solve the conservation laws we derived in the previous section. So in this video, we're gonna be looking at how do we actually solve those equations and what does that look like? Okay, so let's kick off section four with a quick reminder of what laminar flow is. And this should be a review from what you would have covered in your undergraduate fluid mechanics. So we experience a laminar flow at low Reynolds numbers. I'll write out the Reynolds number here, where V is velocity, D is the tube diameter, and nu is the kinematic viscosity. Just a reminder that nu is really mu over rho. So we could also write the Reynolds number like this. And the reason we do that, like sometimes it's nice to use nu instead of mu because both the density and the viscosity are fluid properties. So in some cases, it makes it easier to compare if we look at the nu values. So basically Reynolds did this experiment and he showed that at low Reynolds numbers, we have a flow that moves in nice parallel layers. He called those laminae. So that's why it's laminar flow. Whereas at higher Reynolds numbers, it transitioned into a more chaotic, what we call turbulent flow, right? So in looking at the Reynolds number, one way to increase this value is to increase the velocity. So I'll show a video here where the velocity increases and therefore velocity is in the numerator of the Reynolds number. So the Reynolds number also increases. And we see, so it starts off at low velocities, this more laminar flow. It's nice layered organized flow. And as the Reynolds number goes up, it transitions to this chaotic turbulent flow. Okay. And the reason we're going to look at laminar flow in this section is because it's very ordered. And if you remember back to the scaling analysis that hopefully you would have seen in your undergraduate level fluid mechanics, and I can put a link to my video in my undergraduate fluid mechanics course, where I show the scaling analysis, just in in case you want to have a look at that. For a low value of the Reynolds number, our Navier-Stokes equation simplifies because the viscous terms now dominate over the inertial terms. So we can drop the inertial terms from the equation, which helps to simplify it enough so that we have a chance to generate exact solutions to the equation. And in these cases, our viscous effects are important throughout the whole flow. So we'll start by looking at exact solutions for steady incompressible viscous flow. And in 4.1, we're going to have a few subsections here where we look at different specific geometries. Geometries. Okay, so I've listed here the Navier-Stokes equation that we derived in section three for incompressible flows. Okay, so that's our first assumption is that we're going to be looking at incompressible flows because the equation is then simpler to solve, giving us a chance for some exact solutions. And so now in looking at the Navier-Stokes equation, we can see why laminar flow is helpful because we mentioned it's low Reynolds number, which means the flow is dominated by the viscous effects. So we can see that this viscous term here Right now that dominates for laminar flow. So we're gonna keep that term in this equation. Now, one of the challenges with the Navier-Stokes equation, and to show this, I'll write out the material derivative more explicitly below here is that it has this nonlinear term, this nonlinear advection term right here. Okay, and that means it's very, very difficult to solve this equation, right? So we can't get exact solutions of the Navier Stokes equation when we have this nonlinear advection term. There's actually some movies where they portray these famous mathematicians trying to solve the Navier Stokes equation because it's just so challenging, right? So we can make our simplification, and I've noted here that exact solutions are possible only when the nonlinear terms vanish. And so because we have laminar flow and our viscous term will dominate. And again, you would have seen this in a scaling analysis, possibly in undergrad. It means that we can get rid of this term from our Navier-Stokes equation at low values of the Reynolds number. And one more thing before we actually start cranking through some of these solutions here, this picture at the right shows that as we have flow entering a channel like this or a tube, there's an entrance region here the flow enters as fairly uniform, but then throughout this entrance length, it becomes fully developed. And then it becomes this flow profile shown down here, which stays exactly the same. And it doesn't change anymore as it flows along in the flow direction. And that's because the boundary layers or the influence of the shear due to the walls in the entrance length that's growing. So that's shown here, the boundary layers are growing, but then you hit a point where they cross and beyond that point, the flow stays the same. Okay, so we'll see that in cases where we have fully developed laminar flow, we can simplify our Navier-Stokes equation and that makes it possible for us to look at some exact solutions. Okay, so in 4.1a, we're gonna start by looking at steady flow between parallel plates. So in this case, we consider the flow to be fully developed. We also refer to these as infinite parallel plates, which really just means that we have our 
y and x direction shown here. But in the z direction, which is like normal to this flow we're showing here, we consider that the plates just keep going indefinitely, which really just means that we're not considering the z direction. We don't consider any sides on this channel. So then this would be 2D flow. We only look at the y and the x directions. We say that we have an externally applied pressure gradient in the x direction, and we have our upper plate at a speed u shown here. So we can start by looking at our mass balance. We're considering incompressible viscous flow. So our mass balance is this. So in 2D, that would be this. Now we said our flow is fully developed, right? So there's no change in this direction anymore, in the flow direction, right? Which is X here. So it means we can't have any change of U in the X direction because it's fully developed. So that has to be zero. We've also written that U can only be a function of Y. So that tells us that di V di Y equals zero. V is the velocity in the Y direction, right? So going that way. Now, an interesting thing to note is that at this wall here, and here we know that that V has to be zero because we know that none of our fluid is flowing through the solid wall and crossing the boundary. And because this expression here, what this is telling us is that there's no change in V along this Y direction here, right? So if V is zero here and here, then V is zero throughout this whole entire domain here. So that this indicates that V is zero everywhere. So we just have this parallel flow, flow that's parallel to the walls. Okay, now for momentum, That's going to simplify from what we showed on the previous slide to this equation right here. So we got rid of the material derivative du by dt because our viscous terms dominate. We have v equals zero and u is only a function of y. So all those simplifications lead to this. We also have in the y direction only that term survives. Okay, now it's important to understand the meaning of these equations, right? So this one tells us, right, there's no change of the pressure in the y direction. So p is not a function of y. In the x equation, we have something that very commonly happens. This term can only be a function of x, and this term can only be a function of y. So the only possible way to make that equal is that they both have to be a constant, right? So this tells us, therefore, pressure gradient in the x direction is a constant. Which again physically means that the pressure varies linearly along this channel. Okay, so now we integrate this twice. And that yields this expression here. We don't have to keep the density term in there. We see from the equation we integrated, the density can't be zero and can't be infinity. So it's not gonna help us make that right-hand side equal to zero. So we can get rid of it. And we remember that the dp dx is because p is a function of x alone, and that's a constant, right? So to solve for these integration constants, we look at our boundary conditions, right? This is the common way that we solve differential equations. So hopefully this is familiar to you, All right? We've simplified it enough that we can just integrate it and then use our boundary conditions. Okay, so we have no slip along the bottom. So u equals zero at y equals zero. And that tells us that the constant b must equal zero, right? If we sub that in here, right? And our top plate's moving. So u equals capital U, right? At y equals 2b, right? Using the convention we're showing in the figure there. So I'll do all the steps here. I'll show how we'll sub that in. So that means that zero equals, so y is 2b. U is capital U. B is zero. Therefore, we rearrange for a, we're trying to get the integration constant, right? So that equals b times dp by dx. Okay, now we sub that in right here. And then this becomes our velocity profile equation, right? So we'll write it in terms of u and we'll sub everything in 
And so that right there is our velocity profile. So we see what has happened when we have solved for our conservation of mass and conservation of momentum equations, right, is that we have found the velocity profile. Okay, that's pretty awesome, right? Okay, and for this case that we're actually looking at right here, that's plotted here too, so we can see what that looks like. Now from this velocity profile, there's a few more things we can get. For example, the volume flow rate, Q, we can integrate our velocity across the y direction, right, from zero to two b, integrate our velocity for our volume flow rate. Now we should of course also have a dz in there, but what instead I'm gonna write here, this is, let's consider this the volume flow rate per unit width, and then just solve for dy, u dy here. Okay, volume flow rate per unit width. Of course, if you had a width of channel, u is not a function of our z direction, so this you would just multiply this by w, right? That's what we do there. Um, and now if we wanna look at the average velocity, that is defined as the volume flow rate q divided by the area it's flowing through. So it's flowing normal, right, to this area that's 2b multiplied by the width. Okay, our volume flow rate is already per unit width, so I divide by 2b here, and that's gonna equal this when we sub everything in. That's our average velocity. Okay, so lots of things we can get once we know the velocity profile. And so I've got a few different cases shown here in the bottom right with this figure. The case we just looked at, right, where the top plate is moving to the right and we have a negative pressure gradient. Right, and we remember, again, remembering back to undergrad fluid mechanics, that flows want to flow from high pressures to low pressures. Okay, so negative pressure gradients encourage flow to move. Whereas in this case, we have a positive pressure gradient, right? So we have a higher pressure here and a lower pressure here. And flows want to flow from high pressures to low pressures, right? So because of the pressure, the flow would go this way. And we would have our top plate moving like this to the right. So we'd end up with a profile that looks like this, right? Using our same velocity profile equation, this would just be positive pressure gradient in B there. Now we're gonna look at these cases in C and D more closely on the next slide, because we can also have a pressure gradient that's zero, right? So flow due only to the velocity of the plate, that's called plane couette flow. And then we can have plane Poussey flow, where the plate is not moving at all, and we only have flow due to the pressure gradient. Negative pressure gradient is driving that flow forward. Okay, so let's look more closely at those right now. All right, so in plane couette flow, we mentioned that the flow is driven by the motion of the upper plate alone. Right, so there's no pressure gradient here. So if we sub in dp over dx is zero into our velocity profile, the velocity profile simplifies to this. A nice linear velocity profile in y. And we can also look at our shear stress. Again, because we have the velocity profile now, there's lots of things we can get, right? So if we look at our shear stress for a Newtonian fluid, right, we know that the shear is mu du dy. We have our velocity profile, so we just take the derivative of it with respect to y, and we end up with this, which we see is not a function of y, right? So we have uniform shear stress across the entire channel. That's pretty cool. We want to think about this physically, right? So our shear is a result of neighboring fluid particles moving at different velocities. So in this nice linear profile here, right, all of the neighbors experience their nearby fluid particles at moving at that slightly different velocity, right? So that's why the shear is the same across the whole channel. Now, we'll look at plain Poussey flow. In this case, the walls are stationary, so our capital U is zero, but we're gonna consider a negative pressure gradient, right? Negative, meaning we went from a high pressure here to a low pressure here so our flow is driven to the right so now subbing in u equals zero our velocity profile will simplify to this now we look at the shear stress in this case we get that expression it's a function of y right and we remember y starts from the bottom right, and is zero here and is 2b up here from the way we set up our problem. So you end up with this profile that's plotted right here, which is pretty cool, right? Because we can think about this like, why is it zero at the middle? Well, because we have this parabolic profile, right? Right there, right at that peak there, we technically don't experience a change in velocity with the immediately neighboring partners. Okay, so that's why your shear is zero along the center line. We have maximum shear along the boundaries here, right, where our velocity gradient is the largest, okay? 
okay, right along the walls there. And then it changes linearly from the max at the wall to zero at the center line, okay? And that all right should be making sense to us physically, looking at these equations and translating them into what this flow is physically experiencing. So I've made a little note here. It's interesting to consider that the fact that the pressure gradient's constant and the shear stress is linear are actually general results for all fully developed channel flows, even if we're considering a turbulent flow, right? So we would take appropriate averages of these quantities and we would find this is actually true when the flow is turbulent as well. Okay, so that's just an interesting side note here. Okay, now let's move on and look at some other types of geometries that we can solve for. Okay, now let's consider steady flow in a pipe. So we're looking again at fully developed laminar flow through a tube of radius A as shown in the figure here. This is sometimes known as circular Poisson flow. It's fully developed, so we only have our axial velocity component. And this U axial velocity is only a function of the radius. It's actually symmetric, right? So none of these variables will depend on theta. And if we use cylindrical coordinates, I've actually shown out the complete Navier-Stokes equations here. You can find these really anywhere. I've taken these actually from the appendix of the fluid mechanics textbook by Kundu et al. Okay, there's actually a few different ways we can cancel these terms. We only have a ux velocity, it's understood. There's like an x here, I'll just draw it in to be super complete. The flow is steady and we don't have any ur velocity, so that's gone. No ur velocity, no u theta velocity, of course. No ur, no ur, no u theta, right? So we're left with only this term. From this equation, we're axisymmetric. Nothing depends on theta anywhere, right? So that's completely gone. So this third equation here in our axial direction, flow is steady, so we can get rid of this term. We know the viscous term's dominant. We don't have any influence of this term here. So we're left with this. We'll simplify from nu to mu and rewrite this. I'm gonna use a lowercase r2 to be the same as the figure, whereas this equation has a capital R. And from that, the only term surviving is this one here, because our ux is only a function of r, okay? And I could write dp dx because this equation here told us this. So we know pressure is not a function of r, right? There's no change of pressure in the r direction. So I can say pressure is only a function of the x direction here and write d's instead of partials. And if we want to see the Laplacian here in a little more detail, it's shown down here. So we only had to keep this one. ux is only a function of r, so those two were gone. No dependency on x, no dependency on theta. Also, we can take a look here and see that we have no ux as a function of r terms, right? Because this one's zero, this one is zero, and this one is zero because it's not a function of x, right? Okay, so we only have this term left here. We see our trick again that the first term here can only be a function of x, right? This one here can only be a function of r, therefore both terms must be constant, right? If we integrate this expression twice, we can solve for u and we get the following here. Now u has to be bounded at r equals zero, so a must be zero. And our no-slip condition at the wall says that u must be zero at r equals a, which is our radius at the wall. So when we sub that in, we can rearrange this thing for b, right? So when we sub in, our velocity distribution therefore has this nice parabolic shape like this. can box that. So then again, we have found our velocity profile. I'll put the x here just in case, right? That is our axial velocity. Now that we have our velocity profile, we can get our shear stress, right? The velocity profile tells us a lot of things about the flow, right? So again, from appendix B, I can look up what this is. So we know it's tau xr, and that's given as this, again, for Newtonian fluids. Okay, we're gonna drop the subscript again and note that our velocity in the radial direction is zero, right? So that term is zero. So then we will have, so then taking the derivative of our velocity profile, we would have this. Again, we have a linear shear stress distribution. It's zero when r equals zero, and it's a maximum at the wall. So at the wall, we would have this. 
which is also valid for turbulent flows right near the wall there. Volume flow rate, again, we can get by integrating the velocity profile across the radius. There wasn't a function of theta, so we could include the two pi r in there, right? We remember that negative sign is there, right? Because the dp dx, it needs to offset the negative value of that because we have flow progressing along a negative pressure gradient. Take the average velocity again, which is q over the area it's flowing through, the perpendicular area, pi a squared in this case, and that will simplify to All right, so that's how we solve our equations for steady flow in a pipe. Okay, now another example we have is steady flow between concentric cylinders, which is sometimes called circular couette flow. So the figure shows that R1 is the radius of that internal cylinder. Omega1 is our angular velocity. The outer cylinder is at R2, and so omega2 is the angular velocity of the outer cylinder. So I'm showing again the continuity equation and Navier-Stokes equations in cylindrical coordinates, which again is what we derived from the conservation laws in section three, but this is just in cylindrical coordinates. Okay, now let's go through the uh, continuity equation. It's steady, so we don't have this term. We're considering 2d, so we're not considering the axial changes. We do have a theta velocity, but it doesn't change in the theta direction, right? We see it here in the figure. It only changes in the r direction, so we don't have this. Therefore, this term must be zero. We know we don't have any radial velocity, because ur can't change in the radial direction, and we know it's zero at the cylinder surfaces as well. Okay, now if we do the momentum equations, here are the uh, Navier-Stokes equations. Steady, so we don't have that term ur is zero. We have to keep our u theta now because we do have a u theta. We don't have any ur velocities here and here, and we don't have any change in u theta in the theta direction. So therefore we have the following equation. I'll write a lowercase r in keeping with the convention we've been using. Okay, now we look at Navier-Stokes in the theta direction next, so it's steady, so there's none of that. We want to have this term, and again, we can look here because u theta changes in the r direction, but u r is zero, so we wouldn't have any of these terms here, right? u r is zero, so that one's gone. Pressure doesn't change in the theta direction. There's no way that could happen, right? We don't have any pressure sources introduced that like vary in that theta direction, right? We have to keep this one. Don't have u r, and we got to keep that one too. So that gives us... that because from this term looking down here we only have to keep this one right because u theta does not change in the theta direction or in the axial direction then i can rearrange this a little bit so we can say this this has to be zero so we know the mu can't be zero so the term in the brackets has to be zero And that's the same as writing it like this. If we group it all, it's a much simplified form of this that you commonly see. Okay, so you can see how we ex if we expand that out, we get the line above it. So now the physical meaning of these is really important. So the R momentum equation shows us that the pressure increases radially right? Due to the centrifugal force, we can solve for u theta, right? By integrating this twice. Which gives us this. Now, as usual, we're going to need our boundary conditions. So I'll write these up top here near the figure. So we know that u theta is omega one r one when r equals r1 and we know it's omega 2 r2 at r2 okay so subbing these in right down here is going to give us that a equals it's a graduate course so i'll assume you can sub these in yourself and B equals 
Huh? Okay, we sub both of those in here and I will write that up here because that's where there's space. We get this expression here. box that and hopefully we can see that all right okay so that is the solution right that's what we get when we solve our mass conservation and our momentum conservation we mentioned that we get a velocity profile right so that's kind of awesome now we know the velocity profile for flow between these concentric cylinders now like we did before we're going to look at two of the limiting cases of this on the next slide here i obviously have no no room to do it on this slide Okay, and you'll be happy to see I've rewritten that velocity profile at the top right here. So there it is much neater and more clearly. Okay, now let's consider one of the cases that we had a long cylinder of radius r rotating in an infinite body of a viscous fluid. Okay, so there's just a cylinder in this fluid and it's rotating, okay? So we can get the velocity distribution by taking the solution we just had, but applying the conditions here that our omega two is zero, r two, is now infinity, right? Because we don't have that outer cylinder. Omega one is now omega, and R one is now, we're just calling that R. Sub all that in, and then we just get U theta equals omega R squared over R. Box that so it's clear. And like I've subbed these into this right here. So now this shows us that the velocity distribution is an irrotational vortex and the tangential velocity is inversely proportional to R. So the viscous solution is completely irrotational, right? So shear stresses do exist in this flow, but there's no net viscous force at a point. So we'll find for our shear stress, we would write it like this. Again, you can just look this up for cylindrical coordinates, right? Okay, then we can like sub into that, right? And that will solve to this. And work is being performed on the fluid. At a rate of two pi r u theta r theta, which actually also equals the integral of the viscous dissipation over the flow field. So that's a very interesting limiting case. Then there's another one we can look at, which is flow inside a rotating cylinder. So like, imagine we had like steady rotation of like a cylindrical tank that was holding a viscous fluid. So in this case, our omega one now is zero. Like there's no internal cylinder. R one also zero. Omega two, now we're just calling that omega and r2 is just r now so if we sub that in right to here we will get the following put a little box around that so it's clear that's our velocity profile for this scenario right so our tangential velocity is directly proportional to the radius in this case right so velocity goes up as the radius goes up so we can think of that then the fluid elements essentially move as a rigid solid right as it rotates around Okay, so this is an example of solid body rotation, like we looked at in kinematics when we looked at our vortex flows, right? And our irrotational vortex for the flow outside a rotating cylinder, this one, that's the irrotational vortex we talked about before in kinematics. And this is the solid body rotation right here. Okay, so we'll wrap up video six right there. So those were our exact solutions for steady incompressible flow for a number of different geometries. Video seven, we're gonna look at a few more solutions. And so to summarize in this video, we started section four, looking at laminar flow. And that's because for laminar flow, we can get exact solutions to our conservation laws. And then we looked at solutions for flow between parallel plates, flow in a pipe and flow between concentric cylinders. And we looked at a few different special cases of those two. So essentially what we did was take the conservation laws and simplify those equations so we could get exact solutions and then those exact solutions gave us velocity profiles so we could see how to get those velocity profiles and what they physically meant for the flows we were looking at okay thanks for watching